Okay, so we'll, we'll kick off. We're, we're in the, the final quarter of the day. Uh, appreciate everybody sticking with us. Uh, we have the pleasure here today of being joined by Gene Ludwig. Um, let me just start with an introduction, and I've got to refer to my notes here because Gene has achieved a tremendous amount. There's a lot to his background and a lot, as we'll discover over the course of our conversation, uh, that's relevant to the market that we're in today. But the Honorable Eugene Ludwig, former U.S. Comptroller of the Currency, founder and CEO of Ludwig Advisors, and managing partner at Canopy Ventures. With over 40 years' experience, Gene Ludwig is widely recognized for his expertise in the fintech regulatory and compliance space. Gene is the founder and CEO of Ludwig Advisors, as I mentioned, which counsels financial institutions on critical matters. He also founded Promontory Financial Group, a premier regulatory and compliance consulting firm for financial services and fintech companies, and Promontory Interfinancial Network, which has provided hundreds of billions of dollars in funding to its network of more than 3,000 financial institutions. Gene has proved an adept investor in the community banking sector. Capgen Financial, a $500 million community bank private equity fund founded by Gene and others in 2006, began investing prior to the financial crisis. And as the 27th Comptroller of the Currency, Gene served as the Clinton administration's chief banking regulator and point person on the policy response to the credit crunch of the early 1990s as I mentioned earlier. And Jean also earned a JD from Yale University. So I'm delighted to welcome Jean to the stage. Thanks very much for joining us today, Jean. Okay, well, Jean, we had the opportunity of having a chat last Friday, and I have to say was extremely excited about today's conversation because um, notwithstanding all of your great accomplishments, um, as I did some digging on Gene's background, Gene was also the steadying hand in a financial crisis in Ireland, which, as you might be able to tell from my brogue, is my mother country. And Gene stepped in to uh, a financial scandal at Allied Irish Bank, uh, which actually turns out to be the bank that we bank with today as a company. <laughs> there was a $750 million uh, trading scandal that uh, I won't go into, but, uh, but it needed a steady hand to investigate, uh, to come back with a set of recommendations, which has become known as the Ludwig Report. It did steady the ship there. Uh, it's now, if not the largest bank in Ireland, certainly in the top two, either Bank of Ireland or Allied Irish Bank. It's an incredibly strong brand, uh, incredibly... Uh, great bank to work with, but it, uh, it had an unsteady period back then, and uh, so it was interesting to see that, that, uh, that connection with us as a company that has about half of our workforce in Ireland uh, being paid regularly through AIB, so I appreciate the work that you did there. <laughs> um, so Jean, I, I wanted to, you know, we took some time um, in the first part of today to talk about what's happening in the market, and uh, we've been kind of navel-gazing a little bit uh, at the last 18 to 24 months, but I'm interested in your perspective on you know, what's happening in the market today or really what's been happening over the past couple of years in private capital relative to raising capital and maybe the deployment of that capital. And just uh, given your perspective um, uh, on that market, any observations that you might make just to kind of level set? Uh, well, thanks, Ferdy, and thanks for that excessively nice uh, introduction. I will say a word about the Allied Irish uh, matter before I answer your question. Uh, so I'm sitting in my office. I just started Promontory Financial Group, which ultimately I sold to IBM, and which um, still runs the unit. Uh, and uh, it was like the first month of the business, and the phone rings, and I pick up the phone at about 6 o'clock at night. and you know, in those days, phones were not cellular. Or Deep in the background came a voice with the same kind of accent he has. Uh, and I recognized right away that this had to be Ireland or I'd done something really nefarious somehow. 
And they said they wanted to hire me because they had this big problem. They didn't know how big it was at the time. Turns out it was uh, heading towards a billion dollars, which would have sunk the bank. And they said they had to hire me that night. Now, I thought this were co- these were kooks. They, they, uh, they said they were the chairman and CEO of this bank, the biggest bank in Ireland. And in fact, uh, I did get hired. We had a, a wild ride to save them. And uh, it, it actually reads on what you're here today about. That's why I want to tell the story. A digital transformation is absolutely essential in every part of the financial industry, particularly today. But back in those days, which isn't so long ago, 1998, maybe about, I'm sorry, about 2001, 2002, um, you could still do things by handwork, uh, and you could have figured out the big loss coming if you were doing your job. But today, with the size of entities that you all work in, you need technology, you need things like asset class in order to survive the future. And uh, so, when I answer the question as to what are things like today, obviously, uh, we're in a cyclical, uh, 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 I wouldn't call it a trough, but part of the cycle that, you know, prices are lower, things are calmer, uh, there isn't the frenzy of a couple of years ago. But we're coming off a time of great frenzy. And so, uh, you know, I think the market is great, actually. It's a good time to invest. Of course, every investor gets a little nervous when things aren't rocketing forward. Human nature is human nature. But so pricing is a little better. Uh, People who have any brains are still very eager to put money in this kind of market because this is the future. Um, uh, Now, if you ask me, have we hit bottom? Nobody can ask that question. And the only thing that I can say for certain, having been lucky enough to have a pretty good ride financially, is you always invest through the market. You invest in quality people, invest in quality products, you keep investing, and uh, the quality will out. And and anybody who tries to market time, if I came up here and said to you, oh, it's going to be terrible, hold, hold your wallet, hold your wallet, or I said, now's the time, get in be complete bullshit. There are people who make money at that. I thought myself, you know, I could become a guru. I was former controller of the currency. Stay away from those banks, you know, or buy up those banks. If you read some of these people on television, they're always wrong, but it doesn't matter to people. They keep listening and listening and listening. The answer is it's, it's, it's a, you know, relatively speaking, you know, more placid time, but for quality, there's, it's always a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what struck me, um, again, as I was doing kind of my background on, on uh, your storied past, uh, Gene, that, that sounds bad, I mean, <laughs> but uh, it was the parallels that we can draw uh, between what's happening today post, for example, the SVB run uh, on the bank, the tightening of credit, and the environment that you inherited, uh, you know, as you joined the, the Clinton administration and uh, as comptroller at that time, it was the early 90s, the recessionary impact was being felt, banks were tight in credits, and uh, you were, that's what you inherited. And so I'm, I'm interested in your perspective. You know, history tells us a lot about what, what's likely to happen. Um, so interested in your thoughts on the environment that we, we, we face today and maybe any lessons that uh, we could learn from the past. Uh, well, uh, you know, it's a sad situation. I, I, I'll be frank with you. I once heard General Gates give a speech. He said, look, this is confidential. There were a thousand people in the audience. Confidential, <laughs> a thousand people. Yeah. So, you know, I would say this is confidential. There were not a thousand people, but there are still a number of people out there. Uh, is um, uh, Sadly, both in uh, 1990, 1992, which was a period of time economically that brought Clinton to office and coincidentally brought me to office too for this credit tightening, the credit crunch. Um, I, are, there are parallels. Uh, the regulators overreacted. 
And the overreaction of the regulators caused the banks to squeeze on credit because they were nervous, didn't want to land. And there it really caused a freeze up in Southern California and New England in particular. But the whole country was affected. And the economy was more teetering than would have appeared in the numbers. So it was a frantic time in a lot of ways. This could be the same thing if the regulators don't show some level of moderation. Unfortunately, we failed, in my view, three really good banks. These banks did not deserve to fail. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and the regulators drew the wrong lesson from the failure. This wasn't the bad banks. This wasn't the bad regulators. This was a reflection of our modern era when the payment system has become so much faster and you can manipulate the internet uh, in ways that was unthinkable uh, 10 years ago. So a combination of not just the internet, but the manipulation of social media for uh, you know, uh, uh, gain caused these guys to get hit. And the federal government was slow to respond to them. After all, the facility that the Fed put in place on Sunday night, bank fa failed, I think, on Friday. Had they put that in place on Wednesday, the bank had never failed. And First Republican signature failure is, is crazy. It, they, 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 there was no real obvious trigger except panic. So unfortunately, the response is typical. It's the same old, same old. New regulation, capital rules, and new tough supervisory perspective, which is hitting the banks. Now, why on earth you'd go to same old, same old in the high technology environment? I can only say this, which is the old turtle and the scorpion joke. Do you know the turtle and the scorpion joke? Oh, good. Uh, by the way, former regulators are not really fun on an afternoon, but when they tell jokes, <laughs> beware. If anybody walks out of the room after this, I don't blame you. So there's a turtle and a scorpion standing you know, next to each other on the side of a riverbank. And the scorpion says to the turtle, hey, I'd like to get to the other side. Do you mind if you take me on your back? Turtle says, are you kidding me? You're a scorpion. <laughs> you sting me while I'm paddling across, I'm dead. Scorpion says, oh, that's so ridiculous. I'm not going to sting you. If I sting you, you'll drown and I'll drown. That would be crazy. And the turtle thinks a second says, okay, let's go. So the scorpion jumps on his back. They're paddling out into the center of the river. And sure enough, the scorpion stings the turtle, and they're both dying. And the turtle says, why on earth did you do that? And the scorpion says, because that's what scorpions do. Well, when you say, why are the regulators reacting the way they're reacting, that's what regulators do. New regulation and new supervision. But sadly, they're focusing on the wrong target, and it's causing ructions in the market. I don't think they'll go so far. Uh, one, because they have history to learn from. Uh, two, there are a whole bunch of us, me included, who tried my best to basically say, look, it would be nice to be brought back to office. I've got plenty of things to do in the private sector, and it pays a bit more than the public sector. But if you want me to come back, keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about that um, you know, and regulator um, oversight, uh, we spoke uh, recently about the, the changes. In fact, we mentioned here earlier today the private fund advisor rules that the SEC is bringing uh, to, to market or has brought to market. There's been some uproar, half a dozen or so industry bodies uh, pushing back on that. That's a work in progress. But as of today, these, uh, these rules are in place and companies are subject to them. Um, I'm just interested in your, your thoughts on that. Um, is that kind of overstepping the mark as far as the regulator is concerned? Or you know, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first, you can tell the same story with regard to the SEC of the turtle and the scorpion I just did with regard to the bank regulators. Uh, Gary Gensler is an activist. I mean, he is an activist regulator. He's, he's, you know, really charging up a hill. He worked on Wall Street. You know, he was a Goldman Sachs partner uh, before he got into the whole uh, Washington scene. 
Um, I, I'm myself much more of a regular, uh, regulatory moderate. Uh, I, I, um, I think uh, usually these issues, um, you deserve more thought and care. And I think we are moving ourselves into a regulatory environment generally that is so complex and so intrusive that it does, um, uh, you know, really affect the economy in negative, more negative ways than positive ways. Having said that, and so I'm not jumping for joy about, and, and they don't affect me particularly personally, but I think we have to be more cautious. Uh, I, w I wouldn't myself be rushing to do them right now. But the, um, uh, I will say this about the SEC, and, and, and I have a lot of respect for Gary. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we have carefully regulated financial markets, whether we think the regulation is too much or too little, has net-net benefited the private sector and America. America is a place people want to invest from all over the world because they believe, rightly so, that they can trust our markets. And similarly, the same I'd say about the bank regulators, even though I think they get excessive. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, many countries around the world, you wouldn't trust the banks because the regulators are national champion kind of people. They just, uh, you know, basically do anything in support of their local banks. Ireland is not that way. Ireland and, and yeah, Great Britain, honest regulators, do a good job. But um, that's not true everywhere. So, you know, I'm not over the moon about Gary's rules. Uh, I think they will be challenged, as a lot of the SEC rules yeah. have gotten challenged. And, it, you know, it's unclear to me they will survive court challenge. Yeah. Yeah, there's certainly uh, there's a number of controversial terms in there. The, the institutional disclosures uh, seem to be causing a lot of heartburn. I can, I can see in the trade press. Um, but one of the things that, uh, you know, Chair Gensler uh, and, and indeed his predecessors uh, are trying to, I guess, legislate for is the rise of retail investors and protecting these investors, non-institutional investors, coming into the market. And we talked a little bit earlier today about the rise of the retail investor, high net worth individuals, family offices, RAs, introducing investors, new investors to the private capital markets. And again, just interested in your thoughts, uh, both as a capital allocator through Canopy and just uh, generally speaking, your experience in financial services, uh, what your thoughts are on that on that move. Now people in the audience will really know that, you know, you were having a bad day when you couldn't find anybody but me to speak because I will own up to the fact that I'm a bit of a nerd and I am really, really dote on doing work in the regulatory space. Uh, I think that regulate overregulation or the ba getting the regulatory balance right is one of the most important things one can do in a free society. And uh, one of the things that worries me most about where we're going is overregulation. Um, of course, there's a need to protect, you know, widows and orphans and who get involved in, you know, investment schemes they don't have a clue uh, to understand and don't fit their own needs. And to that degree, you know, I think one has to be overly cautious if one is taking money from individuals with economics below a certain level. Having said that, where you have private marketplaces that are for sophisticated investors, I think you have to draw a different line. And here's my point about the nerd in me. I think to craft these rules correctly, you have to recognize those differences so that one basically doesn't have a one-size-fits-all set of regulations that overregulates markets that don't need it, where people are prepared to innovate, keep them fair, keep them honest, but not overregulate. But on the other hand, one has to protect folks who are incapable of understanding where their money is being put and what the risks are. And getting that balance right is the regulator's um, responsibility. It's, it's what a good regulator is all about. And I fear that we get sloppy. And, uh, you know, there's deregulation or there's more regulation. And that, that is so wrong. What we ought to be focusing on as a nation 
is smart regulation and how to keep the markets innovative at the same time protecting those people that need to be protected. And I fear right now we're, you know, uh, having trouble getting that balance right. It's yeah, it, it is interesting. And certainly my, my initial reaction when I viewed the rules was that it's going to be challenging, I guess, a bit like negotiation, the ideal outcome is where everybody is equally unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and at one end of the scale, uh, I could see institutional investors saying, well, you know, we're, we, we put a lot of money into these funds. We're anchor investors in these funds. We should be getting preferential treatment. Now we're going to have to disclose that. That's potentially punitive to them. On the other end of the scale, you know, this increasing um, audit requirements and, and the communicative overhead and administrivia that comes from some of these new rules might be potentially punitive to new fund entrants. And uh, it is a balance, as you say. Just, uh, you made mention a little bit earlier, uh, Gene, to, you know, the digitization of, of firms. And I, I mentioned your thoughts on this. As a capital allocator in the space, you invest in fintech companies through Canopy Ventures. We're lucky enough to be um, one of your portfolio companies. Um, do you think firms in the space are doing enough to make that move towards this uh, digital first um, kind of digital native investor? Uh, what are your observations on that given the exposure you have? I, I think you can't go a race hard enough to uh, digitize your firms. Uh, uh, and it's really interesting. You, the papers often report the regulators being cautious. They do it right now. Artificial intelligence is the story of the day. And this, they have people saying, well, we've got to think this through. Could be the end of the world. You know, just like people said the same thing about railroad trains and spinning mills and everything else. Artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, when one is going in to advise financial institutions, which I do, the regulators are all over them for not being technologically savvy enough. In other words, actually, the regulatory orders and criticism typically come for a lot of institutions for having systems that are behind the times and are not regulatorily sophisticated. So, the, the, and that's, that's right in a way because, frankly, you can't manage a lot of these institutions without digitization. So, this not only is something that will come, but for a sophisticated firm, you can't become uh, digital enough. This is the future. When I talk to people up in the hill about artificial intelligence, I said, look, it may make a nice sound bite, may get you on television and be fun, but this is like King Canute trying to hold back the waves. The fact is, it's coming, and it's going to come vigorously into a bunch of different spaces, uh, uh, and um, that's, just, that's just the future. So uh, this is the future. People who get behind it will find not only do they you know, lose customers, lose, uh, you know, an opportunity to advance, but they're actually going to end up being heavily criticized by their regulators for being behind, notwithstanding the supposed caution that you read in the papers. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, that's a good note to, to end on, and we have a limited amount of your time today. Um, I really appreciate you joining us, uh, Gene. I appreciate the support of Canopy Ventures, your insights, the chat that we had last week, which, uh, uh, I mean, you're an inspirational character, and I uh, just want to thank you for spending time. Oh, it's an honor to do it. It's an honor to be, uh, you know, part of your great adventure and great, it's exciting what you're doing, uh, transforming the country and the world. It's, uh, it's an honor to be up here today and with this great group of people. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gene. Appreciate it.